Welcome to the online lecture that covers compound composition and chemical formulas. So before we start, <clears throat> I'd like to ask you a couple questions. What happens when we combine the following elements? So here the first example is this silvery metal with this uh, greenish yellow gas. Okay, and then down below it, we have this uh, black kind of chalky stuff. And it looks like two vials of, doesn't look like there's anything in it. So it's got to be like clear gases. Okay. What happens when we combine the two or the three? Well, you may have guessed from the title up on top, sugar and salt, that the silver metal was sodium, and the green, uh, greenish yellow gas is called chlorine. And when you mix the two together, we get salt. Okay, sodium chloride. Um, down on the second example, the black powdery stuff is carbon, and the two vials of clear gas were meant to represent uh, the gases hydrogen and oxygen. And if we combine all three of those together, if we react them together, we get sugar. Now we can see that the elements themselves beforehand um, are actually pretty dangerous um, you know, for our bodies. Like if we actually took in pure sodium um, or inhaled pure chlorine, it would be very toxic for us. Uh, but when they combine together in a chemical reaction, it makes salt which is totally edible and um, actually our body needs. <clears throat> Same thing with the carbon and the hydrogen and oxygen. Um, you know, pure carbon and um, would probably, you know, make us sick to an extent. Um, if we breathed in pure hydrogen all the time, we would die. Um, and our bodies need oxygen. So that was a good one. Um, but once we combine all those together, we we react them together, it makes sugar, which is the sweetener that we use in food. Okay, it's also um, made up, it's a sugar that our body uses to make energy. So we can see that when we have the elements beforehand, they have totally different properties than the compounds that they make um, in this, you know, afterwards. So when elements combine to form compounds, their properties completely change, which is very cool, which is why we have such a variety of matter um, all around us. So it's very cool to think about that the elements, and there's 112 of them, well, 114 actually these days, um, all 114 elements can combine with each other in different ways, okay, to form different compounds, each compound having its own properties and its own chemistry, and they're all different from each other and different from the elements that compose it. Just like the sodium metal and the chlorine gas is completely different and has completely different chemistry than the sodium chloride, the table salt, that it makes when after we react the two. All right, so most of the substances and, and matter that we come into contact with in everyday life are actually compounds, okay? Very rarely um, do atoms actually are free in nature. In fact, um, some of the metals, some but not all, um, of the metals are, can be found free in uh, nature, meaning not reacted with anything else. So silver and platinum are two that are found, um, you know, pretty pure and um, as you know, just the metals themselves, although silver can react um, to make uh, you know, different compounds and such. Uh, but there's very rarely any atoms that are found um, by themselves in nature. Okay. Um, in compounds, the elements are going to combine in fixed, definite proportions, whereas in a mixture, remember, they have any proportions whatsoever. Okay, so we got to think about this a little bit. 
All right, so everyday life is made up of compounds. And we also said that everyday stuff is also made, out of, made up of mixtures. So what's the difference? Compounds are elements that have reacted together, okay, um, in definite fixed proportions. For example, water, the compound water is always found as H2O. Two hydrogens and one oxygen always combine together to make H2O. If we had H2O2, that would be a completely different compound, okay? Not water. It's called hydrogen peroxide. And it has different properties and different chemistry than water, okay? So the, the fixed definite proportions are going to be helpful in um, figuring out what compound it makes. Now a mixture could be, um, you know, any elements or compounds that haven't re reacted together to make something new. They're just mi mixed amongst themselves. Um, and they don't really have any definite proportions. You can have, uh, for example, in this picture down here, um, the left-hand cube is a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. So they have not reacted together to make anything new. It's just hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms floating around within the same space. That's a mixture. We could have a lot of hydrogen atoms and a little bit of oxygen atoms, okay? Or we could have a little bit of oxygen atoms and a lot of hydrogen atoms or vice versa. So um, that is a mixture. It does not have de definite proportions um, in it. The compound water, however, again, like we said, has those definite proportions of for every oxygen atom, there are two hydrogen atoms attached to it. Okay, so that's the difference between a mixture and a compound. All right, so back in the uh, 18th century, uh, there's a gentleman named Joseph Proust who worked with compounds, uh, many different kinds. He analyzed lots of different kinds of compounds, and he proposed this law of constant composition in which he said that samples of a given compound have the same proportions of their constituent elements. Okay, So just like we said, or like I noted earlier about water versus hydrogen peroxide, Okay, water is always H2O, always two hydrogens, one oxygen. Okay, um, Other examples here on this slide, methane. Okay. All samples of methane always have one carbon, four hydrogens, okay? Oxygen atoms are always what we call diatomic gases. They are always found together um, as two oxygen atoms bound together, all right? Um, carbon dioxide, all right, is a compound that is always found as one carbon attached or bonded with two oxygens. And like I, we've said before, the H2O, the water, is always two hydrogens and one oxygen. So he analyzed a ton of different uh, compounds around him and found that they always have the same proportions of their constituent elements. If they have anything different, then it's a different compound with different properties. So we can put this law of constant composition uh, to mathematical work as well. If we de decompose an 18 gram sample of water, so if we have 18 grams of water, okay, and if we um, separate the atoms within the compound, okay, we will have 16 grams of oxygen and 2 grams of hydrogen. So um, we can express that as what we call a mass ratio, and uh, this number here should be right underneath, like it is in your notes. Um, so 16 grams of oxygen divided by eight, or I'm sorry, two grams of hydrogen is going to be a, a ratio of eight to one. Okay, so the mass of oxygen is always eight times greater than the mass of hydrogen, and that's for any sample of water. Okay, pure water, right? Nothing else added or anything in there. Um, so if you take pure water samples from all over the world and you decompose, you know the sample, you will always get an 8 to 1 mass ratio of oxygen to hydrogen. 
Okay, same is true for the compound ammonia. Okay, if we, for example, have a 17 gram compound of ammonia, we, um, and we decompose it, we're gonna get 14 grams of nitrogen and three grams of hydrogen. Remember, this should be right underneath it. Okay, so if we take a look at its mass ratio, um, and we do 14 grams of nitrogen divided by three grams of hydrogen, the ratio is 4.7 to one. So that means any ammonia compound or any ammonia sample that we take from any part of the world, any lab in the world, if we decompose it, um, the mass ratio will always be 14, sorry, 14. It'll always be 4.7 to one, okay? The mass of nitrogen will be 4.7 times higher um, than the mass of hydrogen within that sample. That's because there's always a constant ratio between hydrogen and nitrogens in ammonia. Okay, same thing. There's always a constant ratio between oxygen and hydrogens within water. That ratio is that uh, the constant composition. So ammonia is NH3. Okay, and water, remember we said, was H2O. Okay, so constant composition law says that um, in ammonia, there's always three hydrogens to one nitrogen, and in water, there's always two hydrogens to one oxygen. All right, so here's an example for you to try. Um, it's to prove the law of constant composition. It says two samples of carbon dioxide obtained from different sources are decomposed into their constituent elements. One sample produces 4.8 grams of oxygen and 1.8 grams of carbon. The other sample produces 17.1 grams of oxygen and 6.4 grams of carbon. Show that these results are consistent with the law of constant composition. So remember the law of constant composition means that the mass ratios are going to be the same because we have the same number, uh, the same ratio of uh, atoms or elements within the compound. Okay. So let's take a look at this example. So we have two samples. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the oxygen to carbon ratio for the two samples and see if they're the same. If they're the same, then it means the law of constant composition is um, upheld. So for sample number one, we're going to take 4.8 grams of oxygen and divide it by 1.8 grams of carbon. And then for sample number two, we'll do the same thing. We'll do oxygen, 17.1 grams of oxygen, divided by 6.4 grams of carbon. And we can see for both that it um, is 2.7. Okay, so the oxygen to carbon ratio is always 2.7 to 1. Okay, and that was the same for both samples, and so the law of constant composition is definitely um, upheld with uh, these carbon dioxide samples. All right, let's take a look at the second, uh, the next topic within this um, lecture is about chemical formulas. Chemical formulas are how we represent compounds. So um, a chemical formula is going to indicate the elements present in the compound and the relative number of atoms of each element. It's going to show basically the law of constant composition okay, within it. So for example, we have water, H2O. And remember, the two should be a subscript. Okay, so think of it as down here. All right, so H2O. H. Remember, is the symbol for hydrogen. This two is the subscript indicating that there's two hydrogen atoms within this compound. Okay, the O is the symbol for oxygen. And behind the O is an implied subscript of one to indicate that there's only one oxygen atom there. So when we, do, when we write chemical formulas, we don't need to write the ones. Okay, they are implied. Just like in um, algebra, we, we don't have to write 
1x plus 5, okay, we can just write x plus 5 because the 1 is implied. The same thing in chemical formulas. Okay, so um, the ratio in a chemical formula is the ratio of atoms, not the ratio of mass. Okay, so even though in the law of constant composition we just did, you know, mass ratios to prove that the two samples were the same, uh, made of the same composition of carbon dioxide and stuff like that, in a chemical formula, the ratios are number of atoms. Okay, so in H2O, there's always two hydrogen atoms per one oxygen atom. Okay, so the subscript in a chemical formula is definitely part of that compound's definition. If the subscript changes, the compound changes. Okay, again, if the subscript changes, the compound changes. In fact, if you want to highlight that, do it. Okay, it's not the same. Um, compound. All right. So the subscript changes is no longer the same compound. All right. That's huge, huge, huge to know. Okay. So if I change this to H4O, it is not water. If I changed it to H2O2, it's not water. If I changed it to HO, it's not water. Okay. It has changed the compound and now the compound has different properties and will uh, behave differently and have different chemistry. All right, so when we write a chemical formula like H2O, okay, um, we normally list the most metallic elements first. Okay, so the metals go first. Um, in a compound that doesn't have metal atoms, we list the more metal-like atom elements first. Okay, so those on the left side of the periodic table or those towards the bottom are listed first. Okay, so in other hands, when, we're, when you're looking at two things, combining two elements to make a compound, always read from left to right or bottom to top. Okay, um, usually left to right works the best. So if we are hooking up sodium and bromine, we're going to write the sodium first and then the bromine. If we're hooking up strontium and sulfur, we are going to write strontium first because he's on the left, he's a metal. We're going to write the sulfur second. If we're working with just non-metals, okay, and um, for example, if we hook up uh, silicon and oxygen. Okay, we'll write the one near the bottom first. We'll write Si and then O. Okay, so um, so that's how that works. Always left to right, and if you're working with non-metals, um, you can you know in, in the same within the same group, always the bottom one um, first, then the top one. So here's some examples uh, for you to practice with. If you want to do them first and then, you know, pause it, do them first and then see if you are correct. So the first one says the compound containing two aluminum atoms to every three oxygen atoms. So here's aluminum, here's oxygen. It tells you exactly how many of each. We just need to put it in the right order. Well, Remember, we always go left to right or bottom to top. So in this case, we're going to go left to right since they're not in the same group. We'll go left to right. So uh, for the first one is going to be AL, and it says it has two. So we're going to put a little subscript two because we have two aluminum atoms. And the second one is oxygen, and it says it has three oxygen atoms, so we'll put a three. Subscript, ne subscript next to that. The second compound is uh, containing three oxygen atoms. So we're going to do oxygen again. And um, for every two, nope, just kidding, for every one sulfur atom. So this time they're in the same column. So what we're going to do, we do bottom to top. Sulfur goes first. There's only one sulfur atom, so we just leave it like that. We don't need to write the one. 
and the oxygen, it says there's three. So we put a little three for a subscript. The last example is a compound containing four chlorine atoms. There's chlorine to every carbon atom. All right. So these are not in the same group, so we can use the left to right rule. We'll start with carbon, and there's only one carbon atom. Um, and then the next is chlorine, and it says there's four chlorine atoms, so we're going to write a four for its subscript. So that's how it works when we write chemical uh, formulas. Oh, polyatomic ions, everybody's favorite. So some chemical formulas contain groups of atoms that act as an entire unit. Okay, so a little gang of atoms. They always stick together. And many of these groups of atoms have their own charge associated with them. So they're what we call polyatomic ions. Okay, and in your book, um, there's a big old list of polyatomic ions that you should become familiar with if you don't remember them from general chemistry in high school. All right, so here is an example of a compound that has a polyatomic ion in it. All right, so um, if we dissect this a little bit, we can see that Mg is the symbol for magnesium. And there's, um, there's no number behind it because we have an, only one magnesium atom in this compound. This um, NO3... And please, again, remember that this 3 should be a subscript and this 2 should be a subscript. Okay, it is written like that in your notes sheet. Um, <clears throat> the NO3, okay, is the symbol for what's called a nitrate group. Okay, um, the th 3 means that there's 3 oxygens, okay, within the group. There's only one Okay, so we have three oxygen atoms within the group. There's only one nitrogen atom within the group, okay? But overall, in the entire compound, there's two nit or nitrate uh, groups that have to react with magnesium in order to make this compound neutral, okay? So the two means that there's two groups of NO3s that attach to magnesium. Okay, so that's how that works. Um, so anything on the outside of the parentheses is going to mean that whatever's inside, there's double of. So let's see if you can use that concept to see if you can determine the number of each type of atom within this compound magnesium phosphate. And again, remember the numbers are supposed to be subscripts. So Mg3... PO4, and the outside number is 2. All right, so pause it, write it down, and then let's see if you're correct. All right, so here is the answer. We have three magnesium atoms, because the subscript here is 3. We have two phosphor atoms, because even though there's uh, implied 1 here, there's a two on the outside of the parentheses, so we have to distribute that two to both um, atoms within the parentheses. So two times one is two for phosphorus. That same thinking goes with oxygen. Two times the four oxygen atoms that make up the phosphate group um, within itself means that there's eight total oxygen atoms in the compound, okay? Because again, We've got four oxygen atoms within the polyatomic ion group, and we've got two of those groups within the compound. So that means four times two is eight. All right, so when we are representing compounds, there's actually um, multiple, three types basically of chemical formulas that we can use. Empirical, molecular, and structural. A molecular, chemical formula is um, the actual number of atoms of each element in a molecule of the compound. Okay, So for hydrogen peroxide, it's H2O2. Two hydrogens, two oxygen. For water, it's H2O. Okay, So basically, it's you know 
usually what we use is the molecular um, chemical formula for things. The empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms in a compound. Okay, so that's basically if you think about simplifying fractions, right? Um, back in math, if you've got, um, you know, 4 over 4, okay, is the same as 1 over 1, okay, or just 1, all right? Um, in hydrogen peroxide, the molecular formula is H2O2, but if we simplify those numbers, okay, we can get rid of those two and just have HO. That's what we call the empirical formula, okay? For water, on the other hand, we can't do that uh, because we can't simplify it any lower than H2O, okay? Um, there's no multiple, you know, that would work. So H2O's, water's molecular formula and empirical formula are exactly the same. However, um, some compounds have um, a molecular formula and an empirical formula that might be different. And the last type of chemical formula is what we call a structural formula. And basically it, it's more of like a picture of how um, the compound is structured. That's why I call it a structural formula. So it uses lines to represent chemical bonds and it shows the atoms in the molecule and how they're connected to each other. Okay, so for example, um, H2O2, the structural formula for H2O2 would look like this, where um, the hydrogen is bonded to an oxygen, okay, and that oxygen is bonded to the other oxygen, which is a bonded to the other hydrogen, and again, we have H2O2, okay, so that's what we call a structural formula. There's different types of structural formulas. We um, can have molecular models that are like 3D representations of the molecule. So it's basically kind of like a more high-tech structural formula. Um, ball and stick models, which represent the atoms as balls and the chemical bonds as sticks. We have space filling model in which it kind of looks like, it basically just looks like balls and no sticks because the um, atoms are filling the space between each other. So down here in this picture, um, A here, is what we call the molecular formula, okay? This is a structural formula. This one is ball and stick. And this one here is space filling for, is the space filling model, okay? So that's what um, each of those represents. So, You'll see in um, textbooks and uh, lectures and stuff like that representations of kind of all um, types of structural formulas as we talk about different compounds. Our last topic of this lecture is uh, the molecular view of elements and compounds. So let's kind of go back to a previous um, lecture where we talked about the classification of matter and we said that uh, matter can be classified into elements, mixtures, and compounds. Um, looking at the you know, pure substances side, we can uh, classify matter as either elements or compounds. Okay? On the element side, it could be um, atomic okay? elements or molecular elements. Okay, molecular elements are what we call diatomic gases. Okay, so uh, they are they are elements that are always found as two together. Okay, so two atoms of that same element are always found together. They're never found individually as individual atoms. Versus atomic elements can be found as individual atoms. Okay, so. I kind of think about molecular elements as um, you know, like Siamese twins, okay? Um, always found joined at the hip. Compounds can also be either molecular, which um, are usually made up of non-metal atoms, okay? Um, or ionic, which is a metal and non-metal, okay? Um, 
compound together. So let's take a look at um, each of these four different molecular views of elements and compounds and uh, take a look at, at what they encompass. All right, so like I had said earlier, the atomic elements have single atoms as their basic units. So most elements are going to fall into this category, okay? So um, the element, most of the elements are going to be atomic elements where um, they are going to exist as single atoms as their basic unit. Uh, molecular elements, on the other hand, do not normally exist in nature as single atoms, but are known as what we call diatomic molecules. Like I was saying before, they are diatomic molecules because they usually exist as two atoms of that element bonded together. All right, and there are seven of them. And if you, um, you may or may not recall from high school general chemistry, the Hofbrinkel okay, name, which is, um, represent, is a representation of um, those elements that are found as molecular elements or diatomic molecules. It stands for hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. Okay. Um, if you can't remember Hofbrinkel, on the periodic table, if you start at nitrogen, okay, it makes a 7 on the periodic table, and hydrogen is up there in the corner. Okay. And uh, the next time I've got a periodic table um, in front of us, I'll show you how that works. All right, so like I mentioned before, molecular compounds are composed of two or more non-metals versus ionic compounds, which are composed of cations paired with anions. Now remember, <clears throat> cations are metal atoms. Anions are non-metal atoms. Because <clears throat> remember, cations are going to lose their electrons to become positive charge. Anions are going to gain electrons to become a negative charge. And so when they uh, transfer their electrons from metal to nonmetal, they create positive ions and negative ions that are going to attract each other to make that bond to make a compound. Now, ionic compounds are always represented by their formula unit, okay, which is the smallest electrically neutral collection of ions, meaning that if we take this <clears throat> example, this is salt. Okay, salt we represent as NaCl, right? Um, now, that doesn't mean that there's just one, like, like in a crystal of salt, it doesn't mean that there's just one gigantic sodium atom and one gigantic chlorine atom, okay? That's just the smallest ratio of um, ions in there, okay? So, like, for example, if we had this little salt crystal, we're not going to say there's 23 sodium atoms and... 23 chlorine atoms, okay? Now, we're just going to simplify, okay, down to um, the, the least common factor and just say NaCl, okay? That means for every nit no, not nit for every sodium atom, there's one chlorine atom, okay? There might be millions within a salt crystal, but it's always a one-to-one -one ratio, Okay, so the formula unit is always um, the smallest ratio between metal and nonmetals. Okay, because um, remember, ionic compounds they don't exist as discrete entities. Okay, it's not just one sodium atom and one chlorine atom. It's a bunch of them in this huge three D um, crystalline structure array. All right, so here is an example um, for you to try, okay? Classifying the substances as either atomic element, molecular element, molecular compound, or ionic compound, okay? So why don't you pause it, try it, and then play it and see if you got it right. Okay, so we need to classify them as either atomic element, molecular element, molecular compound or ionic compounds. Okay, so we'll use those different colors um, in order to 
to represent them. So Krypton, if we take a look at the periodic table, is right here. Okay, Krypton is an element. It is not part of our um, diatomic gases. Remember, I'd show you the diatomic gases. So here's nitrogen. If we start at nitrogen and we make a seven on the periodic table, okay, that is, those are all the uh, diatomic gases plus hydrogen over here. Okay, so we have our Hoff wrinkle H O F B R I N and C L. Okay, or start at number seven, make a seven, and then add your hydrogen. Okay, so those are the, the uh, diatomic gases. Krypton, not part of them. So Krypton must be then an atomic element. Okay, which it is. All right, number two is cobalt chloride. Cobalt sits right here. Chlorine is here. Okay, so if we take a look, we have, remember this staircase is going to divide metals from nonmetals. So we have metals on this side non-metals on this side. So cobalt is a metal. Chlorine is a non-metal. That means we must be working with an ionic compound. Compound because there's two different atoms hooked together. Ionic because we have a metal and a non-metal. All right, let's take a look at nitrogen. Nitrogen sits right here. Okay, if we take a look, dun, 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 that is one of our Hofbrinkle diatomic gases. So that must mean that nitrogen is a molecular compound. Just kidding, a molecular element. Okay, it's just nitrogen by itself. He's not um, bonded to any different atom. Okay, but he exists as a diatomic um, element, so he is what we call a molecular element. All right, next one is SO2. Okay, so we've got sulfur and oxygen. All right, they are both on the non-metal side of our periodic table. So if two nonmetals come together, two different nonmetals come together, that is a compound. More specifically, that is a molecular compound. Two nonmetals make a molecular compound. All right, and last but not least, we have sodium and a polyatomic ion. Because remember, um, if we've got more than one nonmetal hooked up to a metal atom, we're usually looking at polyatomic ions, okay? So NO3 is what we call the nitrate group. It's a polyatomic ion. So we have sodium on the left, nitrogen and oxygen on the right. We have a metal, non-metal combination, okay? So there's um, two or more different atoms hooked up together. We've got metal atoms and non-metal atoms. That means we've got an ionic compound. All right, so hopefully you guys did those correct. If you have any questions about how this works, please make sure that you ask next time I see you in class.